the next step is going to be going on to the recommendations. Um, and I know it can be hard to even hear those after you get the diagnosis, depending on where you're at. When you hear the diagnosis, um, you may be in shock as a parent um, and thinking those difficult questions like, what's going to happen to my child as mm -hmm. an adult? Can they live independently? How normal a life will they have? Can they go to prom? Um, all of those kinds of okay. things. But there may not be time to really do a lot of that before you have to move on to, okay, I've got to get my act together now. I'm, I'm being given the recommendations. I, I need to hear these. Um, yeah. And parent differently maybe than, you know, you oh, yeah. might have originally planned. So, what kinds of experiences have you had with that next step piece where you've gotten the diagnosis but now you need to pay attention because you're going to be getting these critical next steps and they really need to be um, delivered in a way that you can hear. They need to be prioritized so that you have some idea when you leave, what's the first thing I need to do, maybe the second, I might even make it to the third. Not mm -hmm. sure I can make it through a list of a dozen different things. And were you given something in, in writing that you could take with you? Or um, how did that go for you? I think the written part is especially important with the next steps. Um, and not to have, you know, voluminous things to do. But, you know, a few very critical things. And then um, another set of next steps can come later. Um, but I do think it's important too, especially if perhaps the father can't be there or the mother, um, that possible tape recording, um, written, you know, everyone learns differently. So to remember, you know, if it's an auditory listener or, you know, visual learner or whatever it is, um, to make sure that as many ways of helping the parents with the next steps is presented. Yeah, and I, you know, you mentioned if one of them can't be there, it's critical that they both be there, in my opinion, um, because you hear different things. Right. And, and there is, um, you know, some shock to, to this, even if you're prepared for it, even if you yeah. feel like, you know, eh, I'm pretty sure we're going down this path. Um, it, it's still something that jars you, you know, to some degree. And it might not jar both parents at the same time, you know. As you're discussing it over a period of, of time uh, in the session, um, it, it can, uh, you know, one parent or the other might become derailed a little bit and they're thinking about prom and they're thinking about, you know, what does this mean for the next 10 years, you know. What does this mean, you know, as an adult or whatever? Um, and and you start to wander and not focus, then you know the other parent is there. So, I think it's really important as you're doing these to make sure that both parents are present, you know, if at all possible. What are some of the strategies that you use to present those next steps and provide them with recommendations? So that's a great question, and again, I think that's family specific. Mm -hmm. Some families are ready to hear very detailed recommendations about what to do next, how to do things, where to go to get those things. Some families are pretty overwhelmed by all the information they've already heard, and they just need to know a couple of next steps, and that's it. Um, what do I do next? Mm -hmm. Who do I call? Great. Um, so you, you need to think through. Um, for each family, and I check in with families, it's not really mm -hmm. a guessing game, I will talk with them, you can get a sense certainly of how overwhelmed they mm -hmm. are, what other factors, you know, Bez mentioned sometimes there's a child who's been needing a lot of attention during a feedback session, that kind of feedback session you're probably not going to go into a lot of extra details. Um, there is going to be a report, there's, there can be another session where you mm -hmm. talk about those issues if you need to, there will be a report. Um, so I like to try to prioritize, really for all families, even those who are ready for lots of details, because it still gets to be a lot of information mm -hmm. all at once. Um, so, you know, what are your top two to three mm -hmm. tasks? What do you need to do? Um, and those are action steps for me. So they're really about here's who you want to call, here's who you need to contact, 
Um, and oftentimes that's just a first step for so many of our families in the system. It's a phone call to Child Find, for example, mm -hmm. or to their pediatrician, to a community center board to get the process starting started. So we might just start with that as a first task. Um, maybe one other person to call. And then for families who want more written information, I'm certainly giving them some. And if there are books there, I will highlight which ones I think are a good place to start mm -hmm. so they don't feel like they now have to read 10 books on autism in the mm -hmm. next week. Um, here's a good, you know, so a good book, mm -hmm. one good website. Mm -hmm. um, I do like to warn parents about what kind of websites so they're not just searching all over the internet, but they're going to sites that, you know, end in, um, .org or .edu, so there's a better chance that it's a reliable, <laughs> good source of information. Um, and, and then I follow a parent's lead around that, around their questions. Um, so I make sure I've highlighted key points for the family and then see, well, you know, what other information do they need during that feedback session or do we need to schedule more time to talk about other issues? I'd agree. You know, many parents are ready and they want to know which of these things should they do first and they have 10 things that they want to do and they're just ready to dive in and take it on as a project and they want direction so that they can point um, that force in the right direction and other parents are really not ready to do anything but sort of chew on the diagnosis for a while um, and so I think you absolutely do have to sort of feel it out and they will get a report and then they can read it and then they can put it away, and then they can read it again and do a little more, and so they get to sort of filter that. Um, I also, especially when it's been a team evaluation, I like to be the one who's in control of prioritizing the recommendations because all of us think that our component of a team evaluation is the most important of all of the components. Um, and so I like to be the one who gets to help the family sort of decide, you know, this would be lovely to have more whatever, but I do think that in the interest of becoming independent that we should work on this first and then on this and then on this um, because I think that is kind of part of our job is to synthesize the kid again um, and help the parent decide which of the many recommendations are helpful. It's a great point. Um, it, it makes me think about a couple of other things. When you mentioned reports, I like to warn parents that the report is going to have a lot of information in it. Mm -hmm. Sometimes scores are low, so I like to warn them about that and explain that a little bit so mm -hmm. they understand that. And that there's going to be a lot in the report about their child's needs. We will talk about their strengths, but the emphasis of the report is going to be on here's what your child needs help with, mm -hmm. here's what's hard for your child, here's the kinds of things that we want um, your child to start working on, and that can be a hard report to read as a parent. Mm -hmm. And so I like to give parents that warning so that when they get the report they they know that. Um, for some parents, and you mentioned those parents who've got, you know, they've got these things they want to make sure you cover. And for some parents, it is things around like specific questions around mm -hmm. behavior or difficulties. And I do try to give parents some time for that. Mm -hmm. Can't have a whole feedback session around how to change behaviors. That's that's therapy and it's been too long of a session or it will be too long of a session if you do that. But I do like to try to give families what they're asking for or at least acknowledge that. So either we can give them kind of an overview of what some of those strategies might be or a specific example of what they could do or again that's an opportunity to say you know I think we might need one more session to mm -hmm. at least start to talk about that. Those are the kinds of things you'll keep on working on um, for quite some time but if you need a session where we start to talk about some of those things we can do it. So to try to balance that as well and again in trying to meet a family's needs and answering their questions during the session. I've also started to use a really short after visit summary mm -hmm. um, and it, it's really nothing fancy. I just list out kind of the questions that I understood that the child came with and I always have reviewed those at the beginning of the feedback session. Was I right? Did I understand that these were your questions? Um, I list my results that the parents might otherwise want to scribble down or um, want to remember. Um, I list any diagnoses that were given by me or by the rest of the team and then I probably not all of the recommendations, but I would prioritize the top couple of recommendations, especially those that would need lead time, like appointments that would take a long time to happen. 
Um, and then it's kind of a one-page cheat sheet, and we're not doing as much scribbling during the feedback session. I think it's a great point to have something a family can take with them that has key points written down on a single sheet or just a couple of pieces mm -hmm. of paper, and to have those available more or less before you've started the session or it's just a few notes after so that you're not busy writing mm -hmm. during the feedback, but they, they've got that. And then we also have a resource notebook that we often give families that has all kinds of information in it. It's a lot, so I will also sometimes highlight one or two things mm -hmm. from that notebook so families have a sense of where to start looking through that information as well. I think it's important to get that started because times of changed over the last 10, 20 years and information is at our fingertips. And um, not only the right information, but misinformation. As you move to the internet, um, you can find all kinds of things. And the, the, the information that's there is only as good as the person that published it. And um, as a lay person, you go to the internet to find data about this diagnosis. And you may not understand it, you may misinterpret it. And, um, and so it's really important that I think you at least lay the foundation of, you know, these are kind of next steps. This is, you know, what we're looking at because I, I think every parent, that's the first thing they do these days is, you know, they go straight to the internet and say, what's the real story? You know, mm -hmm. what did they hold back? You know, what do I need to know? Not That's a good, That's a good yep. point. You know, and I think one of the things that clinician can do too is step back and give a bigger picture piece because you're right, Pete, you can go and find all those little individual pieces of information, but as far as next steps in a more global way, and I remember we had an experience um, with one of my children. We got a very difficult diagnosis. Um, I was feeling very emotional. It wasn't clear what the next steps would be, and I said to the clinician, if this were your child, what would you do? And I was so glad I framed it that way, because the advice that he gave us was not anything he would have given us on a sheet of paper or as you know specific next steps, but what he said was something that we kept with us for years, and, and it's still an invaluable piece of advice and that advice was um, stress is toxic for your child mm. and so if I were you I would you know encourage him to do as much as he is able to do academically and socially and all of those things but it's important to keep that balance in mind and if you begin to see that he is experiencing a lot of stress you'll need to find ways to, to pull back and to relieve that because mm -hmm. that will be his downfall if he's really feeling a lot of stress. Mm -hmm. And it really spoke to me in just such a true way and, and we've always tried to do that ever since. And every time we see that we're going down that path as far as you know, greater and greater expectations in school or socially or whatever, um, we begin to see things happening with him um, that he's feeling that stress and, we, and it reminds me He's not a typical child. We need to we need to pull back and make this doable for him because mm -hmm. the outcome in the long run will be better if we keep that in mind. And I, you know, I just think that our society is very stressful, and we sometimes yeah. lose lose sight of that. So it was just such a nice nugget of of advice. Well, that's a, a lovely piece to hang on to, and also in thinking about how much you're expecting of a family, mm -hmm. you know, in right. terms of the next steps. Do you um, overwhelm them? I mean, obviously not, but, um, but to chat with them about how they want to engage in this. And I'm just thinking how lovely the clinician handled that um, when he said, you know, don't expect so much that stress becomes a big piece of this. Anyway, just nice. Yeah, I think so too. What other issues or difficulties have you come across at this point in the feedback? I think you've kind of covered most of the, the issues that would come up. I think um, 
we, we touched on it briefly, but I think that idea of different family members having different views of the diagnosis and being in a different place in terms of their acceptance of our results um, can often come up. Um, and that can be difficult for families. Um, and sometimes that can happen within a feedback session where they get angry at each other mm -hmm. about it. And I think that's something to be prepared for and, and to be ready to help families understand that. And again, I go back to what we talked about a little earlier, which is I try to help both family members understand that people can be in different places about this. And what's really important is the actions we take and what we're going to do next, as opposed to a, an, a statement of like, yes, I absolutely believe this diagnosis and I will say it out loud. Um, if there's support around what next steps mm -hmm. are, then it's okay. But being ready for that, and, um, and I think being ready to help families talk with other family members, that comes up a lot it does. as well. Mm -hmm. So thinking about ways to either help families do that or again, offering, um, another session if that's helpful. Families do ask hard questions too. Mm -hmm. I think the other piece is you, to be ready for questions around what does the future hold for mm -hmm. my child? What does this mean? Um, I, I think in one, you know, with one variation or another, almost every feedback session I've had, a family will ask, what does this mean for the future? Mm -hmm. What does this mean for my child's future? So thinking through that and being ready for, um, being ready to answer that question. I think is an important issue as well. I think you covered it. I think you know the most common reaction that I have is when the parent is just overwhelmed. Mm -hmm. um, and that probably happens to me more because there's been a morning of testing, whether it was mine or the other part of the team, just because that's the model right. that I work in. Right. And in that case, it can be pretty helpful to just cut it short and say, okay, so I think, you know, we know the questions that you had, we know the answers that we came up with. Let's go through all the information on a different day mm -hmm. and you can bring dad and you can bring grandma and we'll all sit and we'll talk together about how we got to this diagnosis and where we're going from here when everybody is you know, feeling more refreshed. A second session can do wonders. Mm -hmm. it, it's really, I think, when you can do that, not mm -hmm. all clinics allow that. So. Well, I'm, you know, I'm aware that, again, we're talking about sort of ideal mm -hmm. situations and that can't always happen, but if it's possible, it's often extremely valuable and beneficial for the family. And again, puts all that other work that's been done by you and the family into um, perspective and it makes it much more valuable then. You've, you've done what you need to do to make this an experience that the families can use to move forward. Maybe if you could both talk about um, times when you've had a clinician conclude the evaluation and feedback in a really positive way. How was that done and what was the impact on you? Can you think of a time? I'm thinking of um, a, a multidisciplinary um, group and each one said, I am available when you have questions. When they come to mind, here's a way to contact me and it felt like we weren't just being dropped off the end of the world, that we had these connections with these various people on an ongoing basis. And I know that's in an ideal world because everyone's time is very, very valuable. But it, it felt like there um, was this ongoing kind of dialogue that would be happening and if I couldn't think of the right questions to ask at that moment, I could continue that for, you know, weeks to come. And did you? Did you yes. contact them? Yes, I did? actually did. And I they actually, were open to that? They were very That's open great. to that. Um, I had a chance to sit back and draft questions that seemed more relevant than when I was just hearing the news for the first time. So they were appreciative, actually, that I'd had a chance to digest and, you know, chew the pieces. So. I agree 100%. Um, we've, we've had, you know, the best experiences that we've had are those clinicians that understand that this isn't a moment in time. Mm -hmm. This is, you know, this requires continuity over time. And, you know, the, the, the team approach of, you know, as a clinician, I have certain information. 
as a parent, they have certain information, and it's an exchange of information on both sides, and both people have to be up to speed to move forward. And the parents are going to take longer to get there immediately after a diagnosis. So that, that ongoing collaboration and that, that ongoing information exchange is critical. And we've had similar experiences where it's been extremely positive. Yeah. There's no way as a parent you can sit at that moment and ask all the questions that you That's know like that you need to know. dropping a bomb and then expecting the parents to go, okay, well, where do we move from here? You know, I mean, yeah. you are the deer in the headlights that you spoke of earlier. Yeah, so true. It seems to, of course, make sense to end the session on a positive note. So what are some of the strategies that you have to, to go about doing that? Um, so that's a great point, and it really is. Mm -hmm. It really is important to end on a positive note. So, you know, I think we've talked about some of those, mm -hmm. but I think, you know, reiterating that their child's the same child mm -hmm. they were when they came in, and they're great, and reminding them about some of those strengths. And I, I like to remind families of their strengths, too. Yeah. Um, That's nice. Mm -hmm. Well, and Terry said this before, but there's always something that the family has done for this child that was difficult um, and that really, you know, they brought their child to us right. for this evaluation, which is really a big, hard thing. Um, and for them to trust us with that kid is really an honor that they've given us. And so to acknowledge that in a way and say, thank you for bringing me this great kid. You know, I think it was very nice to get to know you. Um, you know, whatever you can say genuinely, because those things are really very often true, um, I think is helpful. Um, sometimes I will circle back to the one or two of the cute things that the child did. Um, and then I like to try to end on a little bit lighter note too, um, and so coming back to something cute that the child mm -hmm. has done, I think lets the parents sort of put themselves back together a little bit before they walk out into the world again where, you know, they've just received this diagnosis and they have all these things to do. But you know what, he still does cute stuff and um, I, I think it helps them sort of um, put their shell back on before they go back out there. I like that. That's nicely put. Um, I think there are always good things to say, and to say those are really important. And again, sometimes I will um, go back to when families are expressing sadness during the eval. Many families will say, you know, I, I knew you were going to say this, but hearing it mm -hmm. is so hard, and we'll kind of acknowledge it. Well, now it's real. You had these concerns. You had these fears. There's no going back anymore. It's real. We're, we're giving the diagnosis. And so sometimes at the end, I'll go back to, you know, that was hard. You could have chosen not to do this, mm -hmm. but you did. You came in and you chose to, you know, do something that's really hard, but it's going to be really helpful mm -hmm. for your child. And you know, I really admire that you were able to do that and let them hear that um, really directly in that way. I think the other piece that um, I like to make sure that I end with is, is emphasizing to parents that they can contact me. Mm -hmm. So again, you have to, you know, it's going to vary from clinic to clinic in terms of what you actually can offer a family, but um, hopefully at the very least you can offer a phone call. Mm -hmm. um, and so this family can get back to you, whether it's another session, as we talked about how valuable that is, or calling. And I, again, like to explicitly say, you know, don't get stuck. We've made recommendations. We've talked about different ideas. Um, sometimes families run into roadblocks, roadblocks, and it's hard to move forward. Call me if that happens, mm -hmm. and I'll see what I can do to help you. So that, again, all this work we've done is going to lead toward some change and um, good programming for the child. That's important to emphasize because uh, we can make the greatest recommendations in the world, but if the CCB won't return their calls, right. it's going nowhere. And so I, I'm like you, I really do want to know. And I also want to know when things go well. And I like yes. for parents to have the opportunity to, I have many parents who actually do this from time to time, just let me know this thing just went really well or you wouldn't believe what he was able to do. Um, and that's fun for them, I think to tell me about yeah. and it's really fun for me to hear about and I think you know probably helps me to make better recommendations because whatever I recommended might have worked um, and so that kind of feedback probably works for the family and the kid and for me. 
I'm so glad you mentioned that because I do that also. And I will also, in a, you know, in a general way, let families know that other parents do that mm -hmm. and that it's really helpful and they can do it you know, years mm -hmm. from now. Mm -hmm. They can call me that same afternoon from feedback if they mm -hmm. need to or they can call me a long time from now and I'll want to hear from them and I'm always glad to hear mm -hmm. from families who mm -hmm. do. And it's true. It is really helpful. It is fun. Yeah. I think my last question for you was what traits do you really value in a clinician? You've had so many different experiences and worked with so many different clinicians. Um, and so you, it's run the gamut and you've, you've really seen it all. Um, and so what do you think are the most valuable traits that really set the whole feedback up for success as a result? You know, for us, compassion is obviously a big one. Um, um, there's no way as a clinician you can understand exactly what the parents are feeling, um, but to have an understanding that there are a lot of emotion mm -hmm. going on. I mean, everybody wants the most for their children. You know, you always want your children's lives to be better than your own. And so as you get diagnoses, typically that is a moment in time where the train is off the tracks. And okay, you know, my child is going to have challenges that perhaps I didn't have. So compassion for, for that and patience mm -hmm. um, in allowing, you know, the family time to, to process a little bit. And it's not going to happen at that one session all the time, mm -hmm. typically. And I think a balance of competence and humility, because with the humility, you can listen and listen well, um, listen for real meaning for what um, parents are needing at that moment in time, um, but also um, that willingness to dialogue um, and continue the dialogue past that one session. I think that's critical, like we were just talking about, having that ability to process and ask questions at a later date. Yeah. A couple other traits for us, uh, preparedness, mm -hmm. be prepared you know, have the information, as much information as possible, so when you ask the questions, you know, they know, or at least they know where to get the answer. Um, and um, honesty. For us, um, we, we wanna know, you know, honestly, what, what are we looking at here? And then also that, uh, that sensitivity you both talked about, so that they can uh, switch gears if they need to. Mm -hmm. So if a, if a family is having a really hard time, if I'm having a really hard time, mm -hmm. they, they, can, they thought maybe I was ready to hear it or ready for it to be delivered in a very direct way and then I'm not really taking it that well, they can adjust yeah. in midstream. They can say, oh, that was a little too much all at once. Mm -hmm. Let's back up. Let's start over with just this one piece and talk about that. And then as I think you're ready again, we'll go on to the next piece. Um, because it's not written in stone. I don't think feedback sessions should be written in stone. You do this and this and this and this, and you never waver from that. You know, you have to be able to read the family really every step of the way through the feedback and see how, how is this going over? Do they understand? Do I need to slow down? Do I need to stop? Oh, no, no now they're ready. I can really, I can really go on to the next couple of things. Oh, no, now I need to slow down some mm -hmm. more and let them ask some questions about that. Yes. Um, that ability to And to checking alter. in at different points, like you're describing with the sensitivity, I really like that and appreciate that in our experiences where they'll make a comment and then they'll say, now, how did you hear that? Do you want to ask or do you want to repeat back how that felt? You know, that kind of checking in mm -hmm. periodically, I think, is a key a element. Point. Or even mm -hmm. taking a break. Do you need a glass yes, of water? Do yes. you need to catch your breath for a mm -hmm. minute? What do you need? Use the restroom. Yeah. Um, we can, mm -hmm. you know, give you five minutes. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you both so much for talking with me about this topic. It's such a critical one for parents. Um, and it's really nice to get uh, your insight 